Good morning, everybody. Welcome to week two of our class. Uh, to all the students sitting here and all those online students, as well as those who joined us on the e-learning portal. Um, today, we're going to move on with our chapters on counseling. We're going to do a very interesting chapter today. And uh, this is just not in the light of um, counseling, but also for us understanding ourselves and where we are at. OK, so a quick recap about what we did last week. Um, what are some topics that we spoke about last week? Sorry, rather loudly. How to counsel, huh? Are you? How not to counsel? <laughs> rather. Okay, what counseling is, what counseling is not. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Right. So what are some of the principles we spoke about last week? Individualization. What does that mean? What is individualization? Yeah, so the, the, every person has a right and, uh, and a dignity of who they are. OK, the next one. Purposeful expression of feelings. What is purposeful expression of feelings? OK, good. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. mm. And also how you respond to them should be in the expression should be controlled. I mean, you should not be lost in your expressions. OK. Mm -hmm. Which is? So you let the person make their own determined choices. You don't force them with the choices, OK? Acceptance, Acceptance which is? Yeah. So you accept them for who they are, uh, and uh, no, no point of judgment towards them, OK? Non-judgmental attitude. Confidentiality. Okay, so the seven principles uh, is what this is. These are some of the overarching principles we have, and that's what we, as we help people, that's how we uh, um, keep these in mind. These principles in mind. Okay. Um, today, uh, I'm just going to. Uh, I'll just uh, present my screen. OK, is this, um, can you see you can? OK, all right. So today we are going to be um, looking at the next chapter, which is um, um, how do we understand people, or how do we understand human and the needs of People. Okay, so how do we understand human needs? And we are also going to look, have a biblical perspective of human needs. What are human needs? Um, what happens when there are needs that we have? How do we meet them? And what should be our place of transformation? Okay, uh, so this, like I said, this becomes like a framework by which we. Uh, understand people. Okay, so we did a quick definition of counseling last time. We said counseling is a process and it is based on a relationship, right? Based on relationship between a counselor and counsellee. It is built on acceptance. It is built on trust. It's built on empathy. Now, in this relationship, what does the counsellor do? He focuses on the feelings of the of the counselee, the thoughts, and the actions, and the counsellor empowers or helps them 
to cope with whatever their lives are, to explore their um, decisions, to make their own decisions, and also to take responsibility of their decisions. Now, all of this is also in the light of scripture. Okay, So the goal, basically, when you are looking at counseling, the goal of, of Christian counseling, the goal is to um, is to is to help others to bring people to the maturity of Christ, especially those who believe in the Word of God, to bring them to a place of the knowledge or the maturity of Christ. Okay, now this could be either done through maybe direct um, when you share the gospel. It could be done through principles. It could be just done through. Uh, uh, helping them see what is right, what are things that they need to follow. Okay, so this is what we looked at in counseling. Now, next, uh, what we're going to be looking at today is, like I said, human needs. How, um, what about human needs? So, in order for us to understand how to help people, we should know how they function. Right? Now, if you buy a mobile, what would you first thing that you do is you probably look into the manual or figure out some way to know how it works. So similarly, when you're helping people, you also need to understand how they function or how God has made man, what happened through the fall, what happened when Christ came. So these are so we need to have what we call as a theory of personality. We really need to know and understand. Um, uh, what is the framework that we have when uh, we are looking at people? Okay, so when you look at um, um, you know general counseling, also so when you look at uh, counseling as a whole, um, even psychologists or people who are working with counts, uh, in counseling outside even of the biblical uh, field, there is a big emphasis on um, understanding personality. Okay, So even psychologists, they come up with this first thing of understanding people, so they come with a theory of personality. Right? Like I said, if you need to help repair something, you need to know what exactly they're made of. So even Secular counts, uh, counselors or psychologists have a theory of personality as they're helping uh, others. But as Christian counselors, there's something that we know is that <clears throat> we understand, first and foremost, we understand who God is. What is the nature of God, right? Who, who he is and what is the purposes of God for his creation. So when you understand God, you're also able to know or understand the way God made man. right? Because what does it say in scripture? Man is made in the image of God. So we understand who God is, we know who God is, and we also understand how God made man. How did he form man, right? So um, we have because we have an understanding of who God is, his nature, and his purposes, the image or picture we have of God is also influenced by a lot of factors. How do you, how have you understood about who God is? What, what influences your understanding of God? How do you know God? Ah, but how, how did you know he was a father? Through the scripture, yes. Through the word of God, you get to know who's the nature of God. How else do you know about God? Yes, from people uh, who influence you, from parents, from loved ones. Sorry? From creation, yes. Yes, from, from teaching that you receive. Yes, wonderful. What else? From the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals who God is to us. Anything else? Through our experiences? Through Christ? Yes. Wonderful. Through the person of Jesus Christ is who you also know who God is. Right? So we have a knowledge of who God is and we understand. So, sorry. Ravali? 
Yes, you, uh, I was I was uh, just saying that uh, is the audio okay? Sorry, I can't hear. I can just type in the chat. You can hear. Okay, go go ahead. Um, so I was just saying, also through our experiences, when we read all of that and we see in our personal lives. Through our experiences. Okay. So when you're saying through our experiences, yes, we're also looking at um, our experiences may show us who God is, uh, or, you know, we may think of who God is, but then we also always need, need to align our experiences with God's word. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that's yeah, like for example, I may, <clears throat> because of my experience, I may think God is a taskmaster or God is a unjust God, right? But does it align with scripture? So, yes, your experiences show you who it is, but uh, when you're looking at a sure understanding of God, it comes from maybe some of this, right? So, our experiences, yes, but it always needs to align itself with the word of God. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Ravali? Okay. All right. So, um, so, so our understanding of God is influenced by many factors. Like we, like we did, we to, to spoke about. We said the study of Scripture, uh, our prayer life, the teaching we have received, um, and the way God's image is modeled to us. Okay. Now, so it's important to know and uh, see who God is. So through all of this, we learn who God is. God is eternal. He's powerful. He's perfect. He's personal. Right? He's a personal God. And he is a relational. So, which means he connects with each of us. He connects with all of us through the word, through the spirit, communing, uh, commun communicating with us. So that's how we know who God is, and we understand that God is all of this. So we have a knowledge of who God is through this. Now, through this, through the scripture, we also understand what the nature or what man is. Who is man? And um, when you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image he created them, both male and female. So when you look at understanding who man is, we know, for one thing, that we are created in the image of God. We are created in the same way uh, that... Uh, God intended us to be created in a certain way, in His image, right? In His image. So in Him, we we have an intellect. We have we are also we are created to be eternal beings, right? So I'm sorry, I just put that. So what are we created? We are created in the image of God. We are created to have a free will, and we are created to be eternal beings. This is the way that God created us. So as I said. Why is it that you and I need to understand who man is? Because, if, like I said, if you need to repair something, you need to understand how things are made. So the more complex a problem, that is the more difficult a problem that comes to you, the greater and more detail you need to understand per people. Right? Now, what do I mean by that? There are sometimes people come with very, very complex issues. It's just not as simple as, okay, I feel sad, I feel bad. There are so many things that are deeper, right? And so even our understanding has to become deeper of who, how God made man to be. So the greater the understanding, the easier it will be for us to work alongside with God to restore people, okay? So um, some of the things uh, we need to, uh, as, as we understand man is that God made men or man or woman as free moral agents. What does that mean? What are free moral agents? Yes, you have the right to choose what you want to do. 
God has given he's we're not puppets God didn't make us like puppets but he gave us that free will so we need to understand that every man has a free will they're moral free agents we have a right to make a choice but we don't have a right to what the consequence i can do what i want to do but i can't choose the consequence some consequence will happen i don't have the right to choose that okay uh, so god also has given us to choose our own eternal destiny so god's given me the choice to choose whether i want to eternally live with him or live separated from him that is a choice he's given us right and uh, we read that in john 5:24 i'll read the verse i tell you the truth those who listen to my message and believe in god who sent me have eternal life they will never be condemned for their sins but they have already passed from death to life so what is say those who listen and believe so the believing comes from whom from us right the believing comes from us right so we can choose to believe nevertheless that's what it meant you have the right to choose your own eternal destiny god has given you a, a right to choose destiny another thing we need to understand about man is that um every person has eternity in their hearts that is let's look at matthew chapter 25 verse 41 i'll read that for you then the king will turn to those on the left and say away with you you cursed ones into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons so which means after judgment you will either be in eternal life or eternal hell and that is what god has placed in our hearts that there will be in every man there is this thought or this knowledge that there is going to be an eternity people may accept it or deny it but it is there man has placed that eternity and it is through our choice and through the power of the holy spirit that we decide um, wh whether we believe in christ or not that will help us into eternal uh, life or into eternal hell okay so this is just for us to understand how god created us so god created us as free moral agents god placed eternity in our hearts and we are the ones who choose our destiny eternal destiny okay now we'll we'll move on to something that's um, here's where all the good part starts okay now what does it mean to be an image bearer so when think of the time back when god created um adam and eve right so when you saying that god uh, god uh, created adam and eve in his image what does it mean he designed adam and eve to resemble who he is and reflect who god is that's what how he created them so before the fall uh how you know uh, tell me what do you think about how adam and eve were before the fall they were flawless okay which means okay so huh? they were perfect okay they were sinless they were pure what do you think their needs were at that time <laughs> food okay all right they they may have had a need for food okay what do you think their ah uh, and so they don't need an excellent right so in that state they were perfectly loved they didn't have a question does god love me does god not love me they were perfectly loved they never and i don't think you and i can even think of that state right but at that time they were perfectly loved they were perfectly valued and 
there was a significance and purpose or a meaning and a purpose in their lives before the fall. This was their inherent attribute before the fall. Right? They were so much in communion with God that they lacked nothing. They didn't lack love. They didn't lack security, acceptance, a feeling of importance. They lacked nothing. It was all in perfect harmony. Right? Because they were communing with God. That was the relationship that they had with God. That they, I'm sure Adam didn't even bother whether Eve loved him or not. He, you know, everything was perfect. Right? Or Eve didn't think of, you know, am I important to Adam? No, it was perfect. Right? There was never a thought about having this. So this was the attribute of man before the fall. That is, they felt loved, they felt uh, valued, they felt um, accepted. So three things, love, security, and significance. So they felt completely accepted, they felt completely secure, and they felt important. They knew they had purpose and significance. This is all before the fall. Now what happened after the fall? <clears throat> Oh, okay. Before that, I think uh, let me let me just uh, add one more thing before we talk about that. Okay. So when we when we're talking about being perfectly loved, perfectly um, uh, secure, and per perfectly significant, you know, as man, God made us as a three-part being, right? I have slides on. I hope you'll uh, you'll have it on. Okay. So. We made a three-part being. There was the spirit, there's the soul, and the body. And all of this was in perfect harmony, right? At the time before the fall. That all of this was in continuous relationship with God. These three-part being, the spirit was alive with God. The spirit was communing with God. And as a result, the soul and the body functioned perfectly right so I, I want you to understand this because later we will we will talk about it uh, a little bit more now when when you're looking at uh, how God made each one of us um, okay I'm sorry I'll probably um, shouldn't confuse you all so what happens after the fall <clears throat> what do you think happened after the fall? Hmm? Okay, uh, where there was complete communion, what happened? There was separation. So sin separated God from man. There was a void, there was a separation because of sin. And so what happened? So what happened? Remember I told you, um, they felt perfectly loved and secure and significant. What happened? Okay, so this changed. This changed after fall. That is after they sinned. So what changed? Although they have the capacity for love, for, for security, for significance, they had no way of satisfying it. When... The, when it came so without any effort on their part, after sin, it became a need. They had to find a way to satisfy it because that separation happened. Yes? So what happened? These three needs, the need to be loved, the need to be secure, and the need to be significant and purpose is something that man began to look for in different things, in different people, in different events, in different situations, they began to look for, because sin separated that harmony, separated that relationship. Okay? So what came before the fall as normal, inherent attributes, attributes that were there, became a need. You know what a need is? Yeah. So the need is something you don't have, and you want, right? It's not something that's there inherently, right? And so that is what got lost at the fall. That man 
And that's why you see in scripture, they became aware of their nakedness. Right? They became aware of their nakedness. Why? Because they started looking for ways to satisfy that inner need of feeling accepted. That's when shame came about. That's when lack came about. So then they probably that's when they began to look at each other for support and love because they began to feel empty there. And that's how, you know, and, and that's the state of man in a fallen state. So all of us in a fallen state look for love, right? We look for security, we look for significance. These are the three, the attributes have turned into needs now. Okay? Are we clear here? Yes? Are we clear till here? Any any thoughts? Because I, I need you all to understand this well before we move on. Clear? Okay. Now, going back to understanding, <clears throat> when we say that we are image bearers of God, right? We Even after the fall, we continue to be the image bearer of God, right? So what does it mean to be an image bearer of God? And there are five areas that we function, five areas of functioning, okay? So it is physical, <clears throat> emotional, volitional, rational, spiritual, and I'll explain each of this to you. So let's start with when God made us in his own image, there are these five areas um, we see in God that's been given to us, okay? Okay, so the first one, spiritual. Now, God is spirit, uh, and this finds expression in man as the image of God. So at the core of our personalities, there is an area of being that can function uh, that can function effectively only when our spirit is in contact with god okay so there is there is a spirit being in every person in every man god has created the spirit being which is that god shaped vacuum or a god shaped void and it is only in that relationship with god is that need fulfilled, that area of functioning is fulfilled. So in every person, there is a yearning for an intimate relationship with God. Some identify it, some don't identify it, and that is why you see people seeking. There is a seeker in all of us, seeking that something, I know there is something that is missing, right? And that's the spiritual being of us. Okay, so that's the spiritual. The rational being is our ability to reason. God has given each of you a brain. Why? So you can think and you can understand and you can make your decisions. Okay? And if you look at scripture, scripture places a large emphasis on the way you and I think. Right? It says renew your mind. What is it talking about? changing your thoughts, right? So God has given you, and that's why God's made you a free moral agent also. Why? To think and decide for yourself. So God is also a big, is a thinker. God thinks, right? And God's thoughts, it says God, the thoughts of God are higher than ours, right? So God has, this is the way God is. We reflect him, we reflect his nature. And part of that is one spiritual. We have a spirit being where we connect with God. We have a we have a rational mind where we reason with reason. Okay? Clear? Next one is volitional. What is volitional? What is the meaning of volitional? The meaning of volitional is the power or the ability to choose. Okay? So we are all choosing beings. That is the part of how in from where do you choose? You choose, you you have a will, you decide to do something. So God has made us volitional beings. So man, like God, has the power to set his will to choose and move in a direction. You also, like for example, you are choosing to get out of the class right now. Right? So you have a will to do it. Or you choose not to eat biryani, but to eat Taidasadam. God has given you a will, a 
choice that's given you. So God has not made you like a puppet, but has given you a free will. And a lot of things can influence our decisions. Okay? But Bible is very clear that we are all responsible for our choices. Like that's what I said. You can choose to do something, but your but consequences is not your choice. Consequences will come about. So God has made us a a, a choosing being, a, a person who can um, 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 uh, will will to do something. All right. Next is He's also made us an emotional being. So. Would you agree that God is emotional? Are we all? Where do you see God being emotional? Okay, that's one very common one. What else? I'm talking about God. The Lord is the jealous God. Lord is compassionate. Uh, Lord, uh, uh, the Lord shows justice, he shows mercy. All of this shows you that God is an emotional God. And that's how he's created you and me. So don't push down your emotions. Okay? So both God and you and man, we are all emotional beings. If you see in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, The high priest understands our weaknesses. Right? For he faced all the same things we did, but did not sin. So he's also had those emotions that we have gone through. Okay, So our emotions actually play a very big part in the way we see life. Imagine you didn't have emotions. When you're eating a yummy cake. Very indifferently, I'm hungry, so I'm eating. <laughs> Or I'm going to get married. I'm getting married because I'm supposed to get married. But I don't have any excitement. <laughs> like Francis is. <laughs> I don't have any excitement. Or I don't have any love. None of that. Can you imagine that? You can imagine a life without emotions? Or someone steals something that you really like. No emotion. Okay, God took, uh, so uh, next time, God, God gave me and God took away. Okay, so imagine that's what makes life exciting, isn't it? That we have emotions, that God has placed emotions in us, that we can look forward to something or we can fear something. That's what makes life either enjoyable or it makes it miserable also, right? But we experience these emotions and we were originally designed with to be emotional beings because God is emotional. God is a person with emotion. Okay? All right? So what are the different areas of our functioning? Spiritual, rational, volitional, emotional, and the last is physical. So physical is, yes, God does not have a body, okay, because he is pure spirit. But when he created you and me, the image of God had to function in one frame, in a case, right? And so, uh, in this case, in this physical case, my spirit and my soul can be expressed, right? It's, we're, we're just not like a clothing, right? Our bodies are not clothing. It is holding our emotions, our rationale, our spiritual being. It's holding that. Right, So this is another area of our functioning. Although God uh, is spirit, for us to have expression of all of this, this is why the body is given to us. Okay, So these are the way that God created us and this is how we function as people. So these are things we need to understand. That when you're looking at a person who you're counseling, they are just not bodies. Like, for example, when you go to a doctor, and if they treat you just as a body, would you want to go back to the doctor? Okay, this body is uh, not well. You give 10 medicines to the body and, and you're saying, doctor, please, I don't want to have 10 medicines. I don't care. You just have it. They're treating you just like a physical being, right? But a doctor who treats you emotionally well, 
who is probably asking you, you know, I have these 10 medicines to give you. What do you say about it? Is asking you for your choice, making you think, right? Is encouraging you in your spirit. Isn't that doctor a good doctor? Yeah. So similarly, when you are dealing with people, you don't see them just as a body or just as someone who made some rash decisions or a spirit who's dead. But we look at them as a whole. So when, why is this important? Because when you're counseling, you can't cherry pick one part of their functioning and say, okay, we will just sort that out. They come in this package. It's a package deal, right? And you are helping these different areas of their functioning. Okay. So clear to understand how God's made us. So up to now, what we spoke about is God is the one who's made us. He's made us in his image. What does that image mean? That we have these five areas of functioning. God has made us free moral agents. God has give, put eternity in our hearts. There were attributes that God put in our hearts before the fall, but after the fall, it became needs. Okay? So are we clear till here? All right? Okay. Okay. So now... When we look at ourselves as um, uh, people who bear God's image, okay, like I said, we are essentially those who carry the nature, the image of God, of our Creator God. And this should be the reality when you are doing counseling, which means any person who sits in front of you, what should come first and foremost in your mind? that they are made in the image of God and how God sees them. All right? Now, so when God made us, what did he put over us? He put over us a dignity. Right? Can you see those two words in those glasses? Yeah, okay. Okay. So God put his dignity upon us when he made us. But because of the fall, we are not only dignified, but we are also damaged, which is depravity. So we have dignity, but we are also depraved, which means we are also damaged. Now, the image, the, the image God gave us was not lost, but it became marred, it became spoiled, it became adulterated, or it became corrupted because of sin. The image is not lost. We still bear the image of God with the dignity God's put us, but it's a damaged image. It's something that's been damaged. And this design, okay, the, the, the complete dignity that we had was violated by sin. And so what happens? We've become very self-centered. Our concern is all about making our lives better rather than on the dependency of God. And that's what you saw in the fall, right? What happened to Eve? She thought she make her own choice outside of God's, outside of her dependence on God. And that led her to sin, right? And so that's the image, that, that's what we carry. Yes, we are dignified in God, we are image bearers, but because of the sin that we, we have, we try to make our lives better, by our own efforts without depending on God. All right? So that's the position all of us are in without Christ. Okay? Without Christ. So anyone who comes to you, this is what you understand. This is what you see. That yes, they are made in the image of God. They are dignified. Yet because of the fall, there is a sense of damage. There is a sense of depravity. Why? Because they... We, as men, are looking at ways to fill these needs that we spoke about without being dependent on God. So there is dignity, but at the same time, there is depravity. Okay? Any questions here <clears throat> before I go on? So, again, to just reiterate because of sin 
like I said, the God-given attributes have become needs. And so, even though we have the capacity to feel, to be secure, to be significant, to be loved, we have no way of satisfying it. So, we become, the need becomes a strong motivator. Let me ask you this. If you, how many of you didn't have breakfast today? Oh, ah, okay, two people didn't have breakfast to get today. Didn't have, okay. Now, if you don't eat, let's say, for a couple of hours or maybe a couple of days, whatever, now don't bring fasting into it, please, and complicate my <laughs> Right? And say, if you didn't eat, at a point of time that you're really hungry, what would you do? When you're really hungry, what do you do? You will do anything to get that piece of food or, or that bread, right? So your unmet needs become very strong motivators. When you need something, it will motivate you to do, to get that. So your need becomes a motivating factor towards that behavior. So if you look at that, um, uh, the slide that's that's here, your, your needs will become a motivation. Like for, for example, if you're hungry, what is the motivation? Your, uh, your hunger or your thirst in this thing. There is a strong desire that you need to get something to eat or to drink. And so what happens? It will lead you to your behavior, which is you go and maybe steal something or you buy a drink and thereby you receive your goal, which is I'm satisfied, I'm satiated. Okay. Now this is a very practical, um, uh, you know, example I've given you, but think of it in more emotional terms or more personal terms. Suppose you feel unloved. Okay. You feel nobody loves you. What is the motivation? What is the goal? You want to feel loved, right? You want to feel loved. So this unmet need becomes a strong motivation to get your goal. And often you will find that the way that because we are uh, damaged in our image, the way that we meet that goal can be wrong, can be marred, can be not depending on God, right? So we said, let's say, I feel unloved and I'm having this sense of emptiness that nobody loves me. And my goal is I want to feel loved. And I move away from my dependency on God because I think, okay, God can't do it for me. So what do I do? I probably find it somewhere else. I try and seek it from somewhere else in different ways. Some may do it through food. Some may do it through shopping. Some may do it through multiple wrong relationships. Right? Sorry. Some may do it through whatever, whatever other means they have, but it becomes a strong motivator to meet your goal. And in the midst of that, we find we get into problems and difficulties because this, uh, th this need, that there are those unmet needs. What are those unmet needs, those three needs? So love, security, and significance or acceptance. Value, acceptance, love, security, significance. Right? Like for example, let's let's look at an ex example of security. Um, maybe you know you're in an organization, you're working, and you're not appreciated. Right? You're not appreciated for your work. So there is that unmet need of okay, I don't feel secure in this environment, but I want to feel secure. So what do I do? It becomes a motivator. So I may stamp over people. I may do some things. I may bribe my boss. Something I would do to get that, even through whatever means it is. Because 
I'm I'm in a fallen state. I depend more on what I can do rather than depending on God. So is that clear? Okay, right? Okay. Any questions there? Any questions? Is this helping you all look at look at your own lives? But well, it it ought to, and I hope I'm able to bring that to that state. Okay. All right. Now. Um, let's look at, um, for us to live effectively, for us to live happy, fulfilled lives, we should, as we said, we should have our needs met. We should, our personal needs should be fulfilled. So when we're looking at needs, we're looking at three types of needs. So if you look into that um, circle, there are three needs. The casual needs, critical needs and our crucial needs. Casual needs, critical needs, and our crucial needs. So let me, exp I'll explain each of them going forward. Our casual needs, um, you know, when, when these are not met, life can be the same. So probably I'll show you the next slide. Okay, so these are our casual needs, okay? So can you give me an example of your casual needs? Very good. I, I saw one dress in the shop. I want to buy it, but I don't have the money to buy it. So I I with, withhold it. Not that my life will be, end there. No, it's OK. Or yeah, maybe I'm hungry. I want to eat biryani, but there is only chapati curry. It's OK. It doesn't make much of a difference. It's, uh, you know, it, it's not affected too much. Your life is not affected when these needs are not met. That's what you call uh, casual needs. So when it is not met, we may experience some discomfort, but for some time. So these are the general, uh, what do you say, the outer thing, you know, I didn't have, I couldn't go to my favorite restaurant, or I didn't get this dress, or I didn't go for a movie. All of those becomes your casual needs, okay? Relatable, we all have that, right? So life doesn't, uh, it doesn't get spoiled or lost because of that. For example, as an example, you book a holiday in the summer for a break to an exclusive resort. On the day of your travel, one of your family members come down with high fever and cannot travel. What emotions would you experience? You'll be sad. But will you be sad for two, three days? OK, fourth day. <laughs> After some time, you will let go of it. All right? It doesn't become so impacting to you. What about? Critical needs to, to get a job. OK, so what are some examples of critical needs? OK, he said, he said job. Uh, OK, yeah. What else related to job? What else? Huh? Money, very good, related to money. What else? Related to some relationships, maybe? OK, or related to maybe things like uh, uh, much more that is legitimate for you. So critical needs are those that may be met in your relationship with your spouse, your parents, your children, um, you know, significant other people. And these are important for you to maintain a good uh, quality of life and a relationship. They're important, like the need for money, right? It's important. If you don't have money, then your life becomes difficult. It's a significant stress. So that's what becomes a critical need. So sometimes there can be sorrow, like let's suppose, you know, your friend uh, cuts away your relationship. There may be sorrow for some time, but recovery will happen after some time. Or you may not have a job for some time, but then after a point of time, you may recover. You may find something. So that's what is called a critical need. I'll just put the example and then we'll take a break. Uh, for example, the company that you work in has decided to retrench and you are sure that your job is at stake. You have always managed with a single income, but now with two children at school and a huge loan to pay off, you are concerned. So that can bring emotions of significant stress, right, and difficulty. So that's what we call as the critical needs, okay? After break, we will talk about the crucial needs. All right. We'll stop for 
10 minutes, we'll join back at 11.01. .1. It's 10.51, we'll join back at 11.01. .1.